So before introducing our next speaker, I will just quickly put a small disclaimer around this one that it does uh, feature images of violent acts, that is uh, depictions of violent acts on film and TV, uh, newspaper covers and photos of online searches. Um, but Cesar has also built in additional disclaimers specifically throughout, so there'll be fair and clear warning. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Cesar Albaran Torres, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Sure. <laughs> is editor of the online journal Senses of Cinema. He is a senior lecturer in media and communication at Swin Swinburne University, where he teaches popular culture of Asia and global screen studies. He has been widely published in academic and non academic titles as a film and literary critic, author, and translator. He is the former editor of Scene Premier magazine in Mexico and the founding editor of ScenePremier.com.mx, the most widely read film, uh, the most widely read film website in the Spanish-speaking world. He, re he researches on film, social media, television, politics, and weirdly, gambling. His book, Digital Gambling: Theorizing Gamble Play Media, was published by Routledge in 2018. Please welcome Dr. Cesar Albrán Torres. Thank you. I really like what um, you did at the beginning of the day of sort of like stating where you're speaking from in terms of your own identity. So what I'm going to be talking about today uh, echoes that sentiment. As you said, I, w I had been researching gambling and online cultures for a long time, about uh, seven, eight years, but I had always felt that I hadn't researched what really mattered to me as an individual. So I'm a dual Mexican Australian citizen. I've been in Australia for 10 years. I also had that sort of like journey into my own identity. I did that ancestry.com DNA kit thing and I'm a perfect example of colonization. So I'm split half Spanish, half indigenous Mexican from central Mexico. And I didn't know where I really came from, right? So uh, that's been a really fascinating thing for me. And I'm also a migrant, and I would call myself a self-exile. Mm -hmm. A part of me wants to go back to Mexico, and another part of me says I have two young kids, and this is what is happening in Mexico, right? And I also consider myself to be in a very privileged position. Hmm? You know, Melbourne is safe. Uh, in Mexico, there's been a quarter of a million killings in the past few years, particularly since I've been in Australia. So I think, or I thought that I should sort of like steer my research towards what matters to me as a dual Mexican-Australian citizen and also as a film theorist. Hmm? So the gambling thing, I, I still love it, but it was a bit of a detour in my research. And I started a research project uh, about a year ago that has to do with the representation of conflict hmm? in diverse media industries, including Hollywood, you know, someone was talking about, I think it was you, who was talking about how when a piece of art really, you know, like brings some negative reaction in you, you talk about it, or you like to write about it. In, the, in my case, it was Hollywood depictions of non-white people, hmm? and particularly Latinos. I mean, Trump has referenced, you know, things that happen in movies as if they had happened in real life to dictate actual geopolitical uh, policies. Hmm? This idea of the bad hombres and Mexicans who are coming in, who are rapists and criminals and blah, 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 right? So for me, representation of ethnicity and gender is crucial in my own scholarship. So I started a research project that looks, as I said, at Hollywood, at other uh, 
film industry that I'll be discussing in this presentation and at online representations of real life violence, mm -hmm. including propaganda by the cartels. So, uh, and I'll be talking about the ethical concerns about that, not only in terms of my object of study, but also in terms of my own mental health as a researcher. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, looking at online videos of decapitations for more than a day really, really, you know, has an effect on you. So I borrowed this title from uh, the amazing book by Susan Sontag regarding the pain of others. So it is regarding the death of others, how to do research about visual cultures of armed conflict. And for, for your own kind of research, this extends to theater, to uh, film, of course, to visual arts. How do we approach the study of suffering? as mediated by artists and by creative industries. So I will delve into the methodological and ethical questions, and I will focus mostly on the ethical aspect of it, mm -hmm. of doing research on online imagery that depicts real violence, like in torture and propaganda videos. I mean, not only the drug cartels, but also ISIS, for instance, has been infamous for spreading this kind of content, and also fictional violence in film and television when it comes to war scenarios. Mm -hmm. They present two very different types of challenges, particularly film and television is seen as entertainment. So how are we entertained by violence? Mm -hmm. How do we approach the entertainment value of on-screen violence as academics, as critics. So raise your hand if you've watched Breaking Bad. Raise your hand if you've enjoyed it. I mean, I've enjoyed it. It's a great piece of entertainment media. Mm -hmm. I recently wrote, well, recently, about a year and a half ago, I recently published an article about uh, the visual cultures of the narco wars, and I discussed a scene in Breaking Bad where uh, Danny Trejo's character, Tortuga, is decapitated and then his head is placed on a, tor on a turtle, on his pet turtle. Did, do you remember that scene? Yeah? And it was like entertaining and blah, blah, blah. But I discussed the objectification of non-white bodies in that scene. Mm -hmm. And the objectification of Danny Trejo's character as you know, a spectacular kind of corpse. Mm -hmm. And all of that has implications in how non-white people particularly are perceived by uh, the global entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. It is, I mean, Breaking Bad is produced in the States, but it's globally distributed. Mm -hmm. And particularly with streaming platforms now, it's harder to sort of like set the boundaries of how entertainment is consumed. Is it local, is it global, or is it both? And so what? I always have this slide in my lectures, always. Why are we here? I think it's important because those bodies that are being depicted, those bodies that are being sort of like violated on the screen, either fictional or real, are human beings. Hmm? They are someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's husband, someone's wife, someone's partner, etc. And the ripple effect of us watching that body on the screen mm -hmm. extends far beyond that person in particular. I was writing a journal article about exactly this, the ethics of researching propaganda videos of extreme violence. And I was just thinking, do I, do I have the right to have a screenshot in the journal article? I mean, the chances of, you know, a family member of the victim s actually seeing that journal article are very slim, but still, do I have the right over that? And I think this is where the eternal question of do the risk outweighs the benefit or not comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And this is a question that we all have when we do any kind of research that has some kind of ethical implication. So. I can't provide answers, mm -hmm. 
but I would like for you to think about these kinds of issues, particularly in our own position. Mm -hmm. As someone who's doing research in the global north, mm -hmm, that has a huge implication being in this position of privilege. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question, right? How do I approach this? If I'm researching images of violence, how do I approach these images of violence? If I'm researching, uh, I don't know, a visual artist who works with post-war scenarios, hmm, how do I approach this? Hmm? Do I question my own gaze, my own position or not? So researching violence has challenges, of course, opportunities as well, which is what makes our research valuable. Hmm. Am I adding to the conversation? And I'm making this conversation more complex or not? Hmm. And obviously risks, which can be mitigated, but they cannot disappear. Hmm. And this is some, just something that you have to live with. Mm -hmm. There are risks in this kind of research. And the challenges are mainly ethical. Do we have the right to access and analyze images of pain and death? Hmm? Sometimes uh, they are widely available. You can uh, do searches on places like Getty Images, in uh, you know, news agencies, photojournalism agencies. But online platforms provide an extra layer of complexity. The distribution of violent images is as old as the internet itself. There was this site, for example, in the early years of the internet, uh, about 94 and 95, called Rotten.com. Did anyone ever, yeah, it's, it's, it was a very famous site it was a sort of receptacle for, you know, very explicit, violent imagery. Mm -hmm. So Rotten.com, then 4chan, obviously 8chan, mm -hmm. uh, blogs like what I'm going to be discussing today, opened a new way of distributing these kinds of violent images. Mm -hmm. I do think they have research value. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's a bit naive to ignore that these images are being circulated, but they do present an ethical challenge, particularly when it comes to vulnerable populations. I mean, the kinds of things that I have watched online for my research, like, keep me awake at night sometimes. Well, always, you know? So I have to, and this is another ethical challenge in regards to my own mental health, I try to, you know, be very careful in how I approach this research. But I do believe that it's research that needs to be done. In the case of the Mexican cartel wars, and I'm not afraid of calling it a war, hmm? I mean, the, numbers of ca the number of casualties is quite dire, and um, it's really bad. Mainstream media presents a very sanitized version of what is going on. And online media has offered another way of looking at the conflict and memorializing the conflict and archiving the conflict. Hmm? You know, if you read in the newspaper, there was uh, decapitation. Hmm? It's not the same as seeing the actual photograph of the decapitated body. Do these blogs have the right to do so or not? Do we have the right to access it? And I guess that's the kind of ethical questions that we have to approach. If you're researching, I don't know, uh, post-ISIS art coming out of the Middle East, mm -hmm. the amount of things about, I, like, have you, has anyone watched the ISIS propaganda videos of like real deaths? They're like very highly produced, they are really appalling. 
but they are very professionally produced. Mm -hmm. How to approach research on this? Mm -hmm. And I guess this is the first question. Do I have the right to do so? What do I feel I have the right? And I'm not saying you don't, you may. If you're doing research that whose benefits outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. Again, and this is quite crucial, and this is sort of like my pet peeve, uh, global north, global south gazes. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you, we cannot research global south realities, but you have to be very respectful, mm -hmm. particularly when it has to do with war and conflict. You always, also always have to question yourself whether you know enough about the, um, the political and social and cultural background of the images you're analyzing. You always have to question yourself that. I remember I was in um, Cambodia a few years ago and I was debating whether to visit the killing fields or not. And I did. And have, has anyone been there? There's this monument with uh, hundreds of human craniums, so like, like stacked on each other, you know, that were nerded during the, after the Pol Pot regime. And, uh, and I thought about writing about something, something about it. I was like, no, I don't feel I have the, enough information, you know? I don't think I have enough, yeah, gravitas to write about it. Hmm? So you can write about anything you want, but just do your homework. Hmm? And don't come in pretending that you know what those people have gone through, if you don't. Also beware of slacktivism. Mm -hmm. of saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, do an art exhibition or an art campaign to change things in Congo when you've never been in Congo, which is what this Kony 2012 campaign did, you know? It actually made things worse for people that had been recruited by these guerrillas in, uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. So beware of that as well, okay. particularly if you're an artist, uh, really go in, the, really visit the place that you're going to be, you know, basing your creative practice on. Mm -hmm. If you're writing a play about war somewhere, just do your research. Mm -hmm. Really put yourself in the shoes of the person you're writing about. Mm -hmm. This is associated with the savior complex, mm -hmm. which a lot of academics are guilty of. Mm -hmm. A lot of academics, there are amazing people writing and researching Aboriginal communities in Australia, but there are others that have this kind of savior complex. Mm -hmm. That thing to pretend that they know what Aboriginal communities have gone through. And I've met a few of them. Mm -hmm. So beware of doing that in your creative practice and in your research. There's research opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of war imagery, you can go, you know, Goya, this is one of the most famous images in the history of art. Mm -hmm. You can trace the genealogy of uh, images, for example. I'm writing, I'm writing two books at the moment, so one has to do with the cartel wars, and the other one has to do with what I call, um, um, so like media that about killing, right? It sounds horrible, but it's like painting, uh, then the guillotine and theater, uh, photography and lynching, and then leading up to, you know, online videos of torture and online media. Mm -hmm. Execution media, I'm calling the, the book. So you can honor the imbalances in how ethnic, gender, and sexual diversity is represented in depictions of war. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot about this. I mean, if you look at the vast history of World War II cinema, you would believe that there were no queer people in the 1940s in Europe. Mm -hmm. Save for 
a few like Mephisto, like Cabaret, there's like nothing about queerness in uh, World War II cinema. When in fact, um, Germans that identify themselves as queers ended up in concentration camps as well. Hmm? Hungarians, Polish, it was really, really bad for queer communities. And it's not represented. Mm -hmm. Ethnicity as well. Uh, has anyone watched Dunkirk? The Christopher Nolan World War II movie? No? Well, it's all white dudes, you know? When in fact there were sick, uh, sick soldiers, there were black soldiers, mm -hmm. Caribbean soldiers in the British Army in the Dunkirk battle. Mm -hmm. Question whether bodies, particularly traumatized bodies, are being objectified. Mm -hmm. And I think this is key when you're researching about war and conflict. Mm -hmm. Is it a faceless crowd? Mm -hmm. Or is there some sort of narrative complexity in terms of this? Just think about Vietnam War movies coming out of Hollywood. It's just a bunch of, and I'm using quotes because that's how the American soldiers call them. It's a bunch of goons. It's Charlie, you know, being killed. Rather than, you know, like I'm, I'm sure that people that have watched a lot of Vietnam uh, War movies have no idea of, Ho of who Ho Chi Minh really was mm -hmm. or what the Viet Cong stood for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So are these bodies being objectified? For example, uh, a lot of early Australian Westerns hmm, really do objectify Aboriginal bodies. Hmm. And that was a war scenario, if you were an Aboriginal person. Mm -hmm. So what do these movies do in terms of the representation of Aboriginals? Hmm. How do visual cultures approach death, trauma, and conflict? How, do, how does our contemporary media and visual culture approach this? Hmm? Are we being increasingly immune to death, hmm? to gore? I mean, I love horror films. I love researching gore and affect. Mm -hmm. And my research has a lot to do with that. You know, and Hopefully, I don't sound very conservative, but are we just, you know, okay with watching someone's head being chopped off on screen? Or do we question what that means? There are ethical risks, of course. Uh, one of them is privacy of the victims and their families when it comes to real representation of violence. And this is something that might sound very self-explanatory, but it's not. You know, a lot of people research, and I mean the, the amount of research that I have read, particularly coming from US universities about images of war, where they don't question who the person is, mm -hmm, but just see it as an image, is, yeah, is huge. There's only one book that I'm sort of like following, copying the methodology of, called Lynching in the West, published by uh, Duke University Press, where they have an appendix with all the names and the date in which they were lynched and the place where they were lynched. So like an archival records of all the images that they talk about in the book, hmm? which must have taken the author ages, hmm? but is really commendable in this sense. Do faceless victims want to remain faceless? Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting documentary. Uh, I'm trying to, to translate the title in my, in my head. It's like the face of the devil, and it's about the cartel wars, and everyone in the documentary wears a mask. Mm -hmm. Do they want to remain faceless? Do they want, you know, a lot of researchers are very insensitive. Probably if you went through a very traumatic experience, you don't want to talk about the traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. and a lot of researchers feel like they have the right to ask. 
we have to approach this very carefully. There's ways of doing this. Hmm? You can find an intermediary between you and uh, the victims of a conflict hmm? through associations, NGOs, etc., hmm? that are experienced in this. Because sometimes people do want to speak out, particularly when the history of the conflict is not being truthful enough or broad enough, hmm? where justice is not being served by those who write history, hmm? which is one of the big benefits of researching this. Hmm? And also risks to the researcher, both in terms of mental health and actual risks, actual risks in terms of security. Hmm? For example, I wanted to do a research project on um, films being produced by the cartels. You know, it's like an, sort of like unacknowledged truth that they give the money to producers and directors so they can produce these B movies about themselves, right? And I was like, oh, maybe I'm putting myself at risk and my family at risk. You know, do I do it, do I not do it? So just to give you a bit of a background on my own research project, which is what I'll be talking about for the rest of the presentation. Uh, Mexico, this is 2017 data, so it has obviously increased. Mm -hmm. This year alone, 20, 2019, 25,000 people have been killed in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's a huge number of people. There's more casualties. There were more casualties from 27, uh, 2007 to 2017 in Mexico than in Afghanistan or Iraq, which were countries that were actually at war. Mm -hmm. So the number of casualties is huge. And the story of this conflict has been told by a variety of voices, a variety of cases. And again, this issue of representation is key in my research. How do they tell the story? Hmm? How does Hollywood tell the story? Particularly there being geopolitical implications in this. Hmm? So the, my current research project is called The Drug Wars on the Screen, The Sociopolitical Impact of Cartel Media. So I aim to generate a theorization of the link between audiovisual media, criminal networks, and global audiences in the age of digital content distribution which I think is key to understanding how images in general uh, travel today. This new understanding will be produced by mapping out how various audiovisual media produced by and about the, the cartels represent the ongoing war on drugs in Mexico, but also Australia, the US, and the Philippines, which is increasingly a very violent site for uh, the, the war against drugs, quote unquote. And I will look into the social, cultural, and geopolitical impacts of distribution and consumption of this media. Hmm? And I interrogate three areas in this project. One is racial and gender representation in film and television of these uh, violated bodies mainly, of death mainly. The digital distribution of content through the internet and streaming services, but also through other online spaces. I'm currently writing up an ethics application. I'm part of the ethics committee, but that doesn't mean that I cannot, the other side, like I can bypass ethics. Uh, and it's like, do I access the dark net or not? Mm -hmm. I, ha I recently wrote a paper about heritage destruction by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And I had to tell IT, I had to call them and be like, hey, I'm going to be accessing a lot of ISIS-related stuff. Please don't call <laughs> the police. <laughs> I'm sort of like researching, right? So um, you have to be careful with those sorts of things. And the research aims to identify whether there are fundamental differences in how these cultural industries reproduce stereotypes about race, gender, and extreme violence. Hmm. So to do so, I have to do a very careful categorization of different types of content and ask questions to those texts that are a bit different in nature. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of background on the war on drugs, mm -hmm. the cartel wars in Mexico. 
Mexico is the epicenter of drug trafficking after the Colombian cartels were taken down officially, but not unofficially, in the 1990s. Have, have you watched Narcos on Netflix? Anyone? No? Okay, well, that's a chronicle, a, a, like a Hollywood version of that. Mm -hmm. One of the main issues, and this is why the entertainment industrial complex is important in the equation, this is an issue that has to do with Mexico being next to the U.S. Mm -hmm. in many ways. Mexico is not a big consumer of drugs per se. Of course, there are people that consume drugs, but it's not a big consumer. It's not an internal market. But it's a passageway to the U.S. from South America and the Caribbean, and also Mexico is now producing opium and cannabis and other sorts of uh, illegal substances. Mm -hmm. So it's a passageway to the U.S., which is the biggest market in the world. And also, I mean, people talk a lot about uh, gun legislation in the U.S. because of the very unfortunate mass killings, but that all, like the, the gun trade in the U.S. also has an impact in Mexico because that's where drugs come from, uh, weapons come from. Mm -hmm. So it's like a dual thing. The U.S. Pr provides the consumers and the weapons, and Mexico provides the passageway and the drugs. Mm -hmm. So obviously, that is also represented by Hollywood. So Felipe Calderón was a president who, in 2006, waged a war against the cartels. So he took the army to the streets, and that just caused the balkanization of the cartels. So instead of there being two main cartels, the cartel in the Gulf of Mexico and the Sinaloa cartel in the Atlantic coast, they split up in many different cells, mm -hmm. both in Mexico and in the US. Um, Los Etas, which was um, part of the military and was trained by the US, then uh, split with the military and formed their own cartel. First, they became the strong arm for the cartel of the Gulf of Mexico, and then they split and made their own cartel. And they are the ones that have used media more profusely mm -hmm. in staging these spectacular deaths, like chopping the head of you know, 20 people and laying the heads in, sh in front of a shopping mall, or throwing them to a dance floor in a club, or things like that, or actually filming tortures and decapitations and uh, releasing that online as a threat. Mm -hmm. So this all has produced a very rich and complex visual culture that runs parallel with Hollywood depictions and Mexican depictions of the cartel wars. So my interest is in analyzing the interplay between all those. And at the end, how does that impact not only perceptions of the conflict, but also geopolitics? As I said, it seems that the current U.S. government is as much influenced by data as it is by media. Mm -hmm. And that's like on record. Uh, in Mexico, there's a glamorization of narco culture. Mm -hmm. They are seen as a sort of Robin Hoods that redistribute wealth in the country, mm -hmm. and there's even a non-official saint called Malverde, who's the patron saint of Narcos. Mm -hmm. So it's like an apocryphal Catholic saint. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty much what the Mexican cartels look like in Mexico in terms of territory. So you can imagine the amount of conflict they have, you know, to own what they call the plaza. And this is what it looks like in the US. Mm -hmm. So there's flows of people, flows of cash, and also flows of immaterial assets, symbolic assets, like uh, imagery, uh, music. Mm -hmm. Music is very important in narco culture, as I will explain in a second. Mm -hmm. There's these things called narco corridos, which are folk songs about drug lords. So the drug lords pay musicians to create these narco corridos for them. And if you watch Breaking Bad, there was even one narco corrido for 
uh, Heisenberg. So narcoculture media is a continuation of oral cultures, which uh, shows racks to riches stories. As I said, narcos are portrayed as modern day Robin Hoods. Mm -hmm. And the narratives are situated both in the southern US and in northern Mexico. They are very localized in that area. Online, um, sorry. Online, there's also a huge amount of content being produced by the drug lords. Mm -hmm. And particularly by the sons of these drug lords, mm -hmm. where they show like their Lamborghinis and uh, like golden machine guns, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. There's a huge culture online of content being produced about these things. Mm -hmm. Some of them have forgotten to turn off the, uh, the location in their Twitter accounts. So, you know, they've been caught <laughs> because of that. Mexican Westerns mm -hmm, or cartel cinema, narco cinema, is hugely popular. And this is a sort of self-depiction of the cartels. They are popular among the Mexican population in the U.S., so it's a sort of diasporic cinema. In Mexico, you cannot find these movies through official outlets, mm -hmm. but in the U.S., you can buy them at Walmart mm -hmm. or anywhere for that matter. Mm -hmm. So they are sort of folktale type of cinema as well. This is, for example, the filming of one of these, mm -hmm. and they are very poorly produced. They uh, follow news stories. So the main, mainstream media tells a story of how a narco is captured, for example. And two to three weeks later, there's a movie out in the market about it, offering their point of view. Mm -hmm. So part of my research is studying the narrative in this and comparing it to how the news story was uh, portrayed in, the, in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And going back to the original research question of my whole research. Mm -hmm. How are these bodies, how are the death being portrayed? Mm -hmm. Just as, you know, anyone or as a particular individual mm -hmm. with a background story. As I said, this is worldwide. We cannot really talk about local and global content anymore. This is just a quick search for the word drug on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So you have anything from Hollywood adaptations of narco telenovelas, which are soap operas produced both by Latin American cultural industries and by Spanish speaking networks in the US about the cartel wars. So there was a very famous narco telenovela called La Reina del Sur, which is the Queen of the South which is this one here. Actually, I'm writing a paper about it, uh, about casting. Mm -hmm. Because it seems that in Hollywood, any brown person can pass as Mexican. So I call it doing Mexican face, right? So Alice Braga, she's a fantastic actress, but she's Brazilian and has a terrible Spanish accent. Mm -hmm. uh, anything from that to documentaries being produced by Netflix, uh, quality television series being produced by Spanish-speaking networks in the US, etc. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, if I scroll down, it's huge, sorry. It goes down and down. Mm -hmm. Narco television is also an important uh, aspect of my research. So both Hollywood productions, like Wits, did anyone watch Wits? No, yep. So a chapter in my book has to do with this threat to the pure white American suburbia mm -hmm. of this person, Nancy Botwin, being sort of driven into dealing drugs. Mm -hmm. Ozark is another good example, a Netflix show, and even Breaking Bad, right? 
this sort of like corrupting influence coming from south of the border. Uh, the Bridge, which is an adaptation of the uh, Scandi Noir TV show set in the US-Mexico border, Narcos as well, and there's also Latin American productions, a wide variety of Latin American productions coming from Colombia, from Mexico, and from uh, Spanish-speaking networks in the US. And obviously, Hollywood, mm -hmm. which started with Miami Vice, the Michael Mann TV show, which is an icon of 1980s television, Scarface, Traffic, uh, another case of miscasting, where uh, Benicio del Toro, who's a fantastic Puerto Rican actor but can't speak Tijuana accent for his life, mm -hmm. was cast as this uh, Tijuana cop training day, No Country for Old Men, mm -hmm. which is again a fantastic film, but very problematic in terms of representation. Mm -hmm. It's a classic Western in the sense of its narrative where uh, Josh Brolin, the white dude, just kills a bunch of Mexicans, hmm? faceless Mexicans. And Sicario. Did anyone watch this movie? Hmm? A Denise Villeneuve movie. It's a fantastic movie where you have uh, this um, DA agent portrayed by Emily Blunt researching and trying to capture bad narcos right, after finding a safe house with bodies inside the walls, like a huge amount of bodies inside the walls. And there's a very interesting scene in uh, Sicario where she's questioning whether she should continue on this quest to capture the bad guys or not. Hmm? She's like, oh, should I do it, should I not? And then she goes online and searches. Hmm? So these are actual screenshots from the movie. She goes online and searches and sees all these images of violence. So as a researcher, that provided me with a very good insight into how these visual cultures that exist on the internet are being represented as well. It's like Matryoshka doll, like a double layering of you know, my research topic. There's a lot of uh, bodies being hung from bridges. It's not just death, but it's spectacular death. Death as a spectacle. And Mexican authors have also, and this is, I think it's key to understanding how the wars are being represented is looking at Mexican authors. Uh, Amate Escalante in a movie called Eli did a great representation of this. It won the um, Golden Palm at Cannes for Best Director in a year when Steven Spielberg was the head of the jury. Hmm? So that's quite significant, I think. And also a question of national cinema. Hmm. Is it possible to produce anything other than cartel-related movies in the current juncture? Hmm. Uh, this is one of the movies, uh, Ellie, the one I'm, I was uh, telling you about. This is a really interesting scene in which they are playing a video game, a uh, first-person shooter, killing a bunch of people, and then this kid is asked to torture a rival gang member. Hmm? So violence on the screen and then violence being enacted in real life. This is another really interesting movie. It's a documentary called The Devil's Freedom, the one I was uh, uh, telling you about. So it's interviews with ex executioners and victims of the narco wars, including children. Hmm? And it communicates with slasher horror, for example, through the visual representation of, of the war. So I guess this is a real good sort of like middle ground kind of text to, for, for me or anyone doing research about the visual cultures of the narco wars to understand sort of like the interplay between the camera and the victims. And the third and last sort of landscape in which these uh, wars are being represented visually is an increasing amount of blocks that are being described as the WikiLeaks of the narco wars where people send 
images and videos of what is actually going on. Hmm? They range from anything, uh, including uh, people filming um, sort of like gunshots from under a table in a restaurant, for example, to people being actually being killed and tortured to one of the most uh, disturbing ones that I've watched is someone playing soccer with a human head, hmm? like, a real, like a real life human head. Hmm? So I guess the question is, is this ethical or not? I mean, I won't read the whole thing, but that's what they describe their own um, website as. Hmm? Not taking sides, but showing what is going on, what is really happening, as they describe it. And then as researchers, how do we approach this text? And that's a question that I'm sort of like answering myself. And if you are doing any research that has to do with visual cultures, uh, art, photojournalism, it's a question that you also have to ask yourself. Do I have the right to do this or not? Do the, way, do, the, do the benefits outweigh the risk? In my case, I think it does. There's very little research being done about this. And I do think that it is important to research it. This is one of the images that I was going to show that I didn't show. Thanks for uh, telling me not to. So this is a newspaper photograph like a mainstream newspaper photograph of a scene. It says they find 15 decapitated heads in Acapulco. Mm -hmm. And then I looked, and this is what I've been doing, so I have an archive of images uh, to compare mainstream newspaper depictions and then how these online sites like Blog del Narco show the same, uh, the same news story and there was a very disturbing image of a pile of decapitated heads. Sorry for showing you that. <laughs> so there's a real, a clear difference. Mm -hmm. And why does it matter? Because people perceive this conflict differently. In a context like the Mexican context, is it worth it showing these very gorish images? Not for entertainment value, although some people will find it entertaining, just like people uh, visiting Rotten.com in the early internet found, found it in entertaining. There's a certain amount of rush in watching these kinds of images, but also in terms of, look, this is what is happening. This is what it looks like. Hmm? This is a very good example of that. Hmm? Do you guys know where this comes from? And it changed visual culture significantly when it comes to depictions of war. Mm -hmm. It was like sort of like the backstage of the war in Iraq. So does everyone know what this is? Mm -hmm. So the Abu Ghraib uh, uh, prison photographs, there was this very sanitized version of the conflict. Mm -hmm. I do think that the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War are sort of the same conflict. When... Um, the U.S. first bombed Baghdad. I'm sure you remember or have seen, if you are not as old as me, or have seen those images of Baghdad being lit up at night with all these green lights. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bother Yard uh, wrote extensively about this. Uh, he had a very famous and influential essay called The, Col the, the Gulf War Did Not Take Place, mm -hmm. talking about the mediation of CNN and other networks. Mm -hmm. That's what war looked like. That's what the U.S. war in Iraq looked like up until this moment. Where photographs being taken digitally by members of the U.S. Army in a prison mm -hmm, were distributed. You know, these are the least sort of like morbid images in the stack of images that were found. Mm -hmm. Others have uh, prisoners piled up uh, soldiers peeing on prisoners or uh, simulating sexual acts <coughs> on the prisoners. Mm -hmm. This image in particular became iconic for its religious connotations. 
Uh, if you think of movies like Children of Men, you can see the exact same image in the background. Mm -hmm. So it changed how war was perceived and how that war was perceived, not only globally, but also locally in the US. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, this is what it looks like. You know, I would say that this, in particular, this image is one of the most important images in the history of Western visual culture because of that. And following this, yeah, I'm very wary of the time. I have five more minutes, yeah. Uh, following this, narco-propaganda does the same kind of thing. They are, it's intended to intimidate, dehumanize, and dominate. So you have these opposing forces, right? ISIS, of course, mm -hmm. is another one of the geopolitical actors that uh, has recently been using very complex videos. If you ever watch one of these videos, it's, very per it's shot, quote unquote, beautifully. Mm -hmm. It has track shots, they have cranes, mm -hmm. it's in HD, and it makes death a spectacle. And my interest is in how these real life spectacles communicate with the spectacles being produced by the industrial entertainment complex. And of course, this image that also changed our perception of, of, uh, of war. This is how I want to end my talk. Um, Susan Sontag wrote about this image in regarding the pain of others talking about a continuation of the tele-intimacy with death and destruction. Mm -hmm. How do we mediate and how do we experience this tele-intimacy with death and destruction? Mm -hmm. How do we communicate it? How do we put it into words? How do we express the affect that it triggers in us? Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, a question worth asking. So it has challenges, opportunities, and risks. Thank you.